I am a writer and a photographer, and I am particularly interested in historical travel. One of my um, one of my most favorite things to write about over the last ten years have been historic trails. And uh, a few years ago, I guess it's been about seven years ago now, I discovered that the Butterfield Overland Mail stagecoach route went through Oklahoma. I, I really had no idea before I came across uh, an obscure pamphlet at the Oklahoma Historical Society and started digging into it. And we found that it was the perfect topic for some adventure travel and, and some magazine articles. And the, the deeper that I got into the subject, the more I realized that there was more than a magazine article in the topic. And I have written multiple articles now, but uh, decided that it really needed to be a book because there is a great deal to be told just about the 200 miles that go through uh, what was then the Indian Territory and is now uh, southeastern Oklahoma. The, the map that I have up here, and I realize you can't really see the, the details of the map, um, but it, it's hand drawn by a prominent Oklahoma historian, Miss Muriel Wright, and she was so uh, she and Grant Foreman both were prominent Oklahoma historians, and they were actually, as far as we know, or I should say, as far as I know, the first historians to write about retracing the Butterfield Overland Mail stagecoach route uh, on a state-specific level. And Miss Wright actually traveled with Roscoe and Margaret Conkling on their second trip through Oklahoma in 1932. And uh, so I, I just, I appreciate her, her hand-drawn map here and wanted to share that with you. So I'm gonna give you a little background about the Indian Territory uh, and maybe fill in a little bit about, <clears throat> about what may be a blank space for, for many people. I'll talk about the early trails that went through the Indian Territory and give you a glimpse of what the Choctaw Nation was like in 1858 because it was mostly the Choctaw Nation that the Butterfield Overland Mail stagecoach route went through when it passed through Indian Territory uh, beginning in 1858. Now just to give you some background about the existence of Indian Territory, it was uh, as early as the Louisiana Purchase and probably before then when uh, the US government was thinking about removing the Indian tribes that were living in the southeastern part of the United States west of the Mississippi. And in 1803, President Thomas Jefferson wrote to William Henry Harrison, our settlements will gradually circumscribe and approach the Indians and they will in time either incorporate with us as citizens of the United States or remove beyond the Mississippi. And ultimately, the, um, the opportunity to incorporate as citizens of the United States didn't really come during the 19th century, and it didn't really present itself as an opportunity. But as early as 1803, we can see that, uh, that this was sort of the, the writing on the wall for the uh, southeastern tribes. Now, I don't have to explain the Louisiana Purchase to you, but I, I do want to show you the area that was originally conceived as Indian Territory. So it's right in here, below the 37th, below the 37th parallel. And uh, the Osage Indians actually occupied that territory at the time, so there were some conflicts that emerged over the next uh, quarter century as a result of that. But that was originally Indian country. So 1803, we get the Louisiana uh, Territory. 27, 27 years later, a great deal had happened. Some of the Cherokees had actually migrated into Western Arkansas, which was a Arkansas territory at the time, which included um, what we now think of as Oklahoma. The Creek Indians had begun their migration, and some of the Choctaws had begun their migration, but really not a whole lot had happened. And Andrew Jackson, um, who said in his, uh, 
annual message to Congress in 1830 that the government owes to the new states a duty to extinguish as soon as possible the Indian title to all lands, which Congress themselves have included in their limits. And then with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, it gave the government the authority to make relocation of the Indians compulsory. And so that really set things in motion to force the removals. And very quickly, uh, we had the, uh, the 1830 Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek in which the Choctaws ceded their lands east of the Mississippi to the U.S. government and in trade for the lands west of the Mississippi in the Indian Territory. So this map shows actually what were all five of the southeastern tribes which we for many years called the five civilized tribes and that language is not considered appropriate anymore, uh, so we do refer to them as the five tribes, but uh, they had been assimilating for many years, since the 18th century, uh, to the white man's trappings of civilization and intermarrying with whites, especially the Scotch-Irish, so you'll see many Scottish and Irish names uh, among the, especially the Creeks and the Choctaws and the Chickasaws. Uh, but the, the five tribes uh, were, and still are, the Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, Seminoles, and Cherokees. So beginning in a, around 1830 and, in, and until about 1840, the removals took place. And this map shows that uh, between uh, Georgia, between Georgia and Alabama, uh, onto the west, they all moved up into east, what is now eastern Oklahoma. The, you know, many of you I'm sure have heard of the Trail of Tears, and it really, uh, the terminology the Trail of Tears actually came from the Cherokee removal, but the hardships that they experienced along the, the journeys that they undertook were uh, very similar to those of the other tribes. So again, this is one of those maps that's hard to see. But right here is the Choctaw Nation, and above it is the Cherokee Nation. To the west is the Creek Nation. The Seminoles are right in here, and down here are the Chickasaws. This map was uh, drawn in 1868, so it was after the Civil War and after the Reconstruction Treaties of 1866. Previously, the Choctaw Territory went all the way out here to the 100th Meridian. But uh, the, uh, the tribes were forced to give up some things after they sided with the Confederacy in the Civil War, and their land was one of those things. So we'll, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And I also wanted to mention that uh, we, we use the term the tribes, and then in Oklahoma that's what we say, well, the tribes did this and the tribes did that, and they, the tribes have casinos, et cetera. But, um, in, in fact, they were sovereign nations, and the, they, they had constitutional governments, and the United States government treated with them as sovereign nations, and that's how they thought of themselves. So it's, it's really more appropriate to think of them as in that sense, and uh, that is uh, certainly how they think of themselves today, although their sovereignty is, is not as complete as, as they saw it uh, 150 years ago. So uh, enough of that, on to the, the, some discussion about trails. Um, the uh, Indian Territory had several early trails running through it, and each of which I will address briefly. There's the Texas Road, the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road, the California Road, which was the southern version of the Northern California Road, also known as Marcy's Road. And then the Butterfield Overland Mail Company route, which used both the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road and the Texas Road. So again, uh, I apologize for this being hard to read, but I hope that you can see this red line running down here. This, this is the Texas Road, and it's, it's really the earliest of these thoroughfares running north to south, starting about Baxter Springs, Kansas, and um, coming down here and in leaving the Indian Territory uh, when it crossed the Red River into Texas. 
th this road was used beginning well before 1820, uh, and it was uh, at first the Osage Trace. So the Osage, as I mentioned, had a large territory that went north of here into Kansas and Missouri, and they would come down here into northeastern Oklahoma for the salt in the salt springs. Uh, in addition to that, the French and American fur traders used this trace to, uh, to trade with the Osages. So originally, that is how it got started. It became known as the Texas Road because of the, in the 1830s and 40s, the heavy migration into Texas from settlers from uh, Missouri and Arkansas and other areas. And then it became even busier in 1849 and 1850 with the, with the gold rush because this was actually part of Marcy's Road that was uh, uh, the Doña Ana Road that he developed on his return trip from Santa Fe on his 1849 journey out there. So uh, the Texas Road was really probably the most prominent early road in Indian Territory and probably the most important because eventually the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railway, which was the first railroad to run through Indian Territory, laid its tracks parallel to the line of the Texas Road. And it um, now is U.S. Highway 69. So that, that route has had a long life and is still a very vital route. So a, a few things that you can still see along this, this uh, the Texas road through Oklahoma. I have to say that it's interesting to me that as, as important as this road was, the fact that it is now a, a U.S. highway means that the road's kind of been paved over. And there's not a lot to see in terms of the, um, the actual physical remnants of the trail itself. And that is in contrast to what we will see about the Butterfield Road and uh, happily. So uh, Texas was a very important road. Uh, the, um, uh, the salt springs were a, an important natural resource and one of the settlements that was actually from the Choteau family of St. Louis that established St. Louis. One of the Choteaus came down into Indian Territory, persuaded some of the Osages to come down with him, several thousand uh, Osage to come with him and uh, set up a very thriving fur trading uh, enterprise down there in that area. And Salina is a little town in uh, northeastern Oklahoma that was at the site of Choteau's Grand Saline. And uh, the, the only thing that's left of it is that I can find is the salt kettle in downtown Salina, Oklahoma. Then in 1821, along the Texas Road, the United Foreign Mission Society established Union Mission, the Protestant mission to the Osages, and it was near a salt spring by the Texas Road. The only thing that's left of that is a monument and a, and a cemetery, and this site was also where the first printing press in Indian Territory was set up in 1835. The, there was a very important trading post at the confluence of the Verdigree, Grand, and Arkansas Rivers. It was a place called Three Forks, and there's a monument there in, near Muskogee, Oklahoma that commemorates the Three Forks trading post, as well as the Texas Road, the Creek and Osage agencies which were there, Sam Houston's residence there, because he lived there for a while, and Washington Irving's visit to the Indian Territory in 1832. And if you've never read his account of that, it's fascinating. It's called A Tour on the Prairies. Another important landmark along the Texas Road is Fort Gibson, which was the first U.S. Army post to be established in Indian Territory in 1824. There's a rebuilt stockade there, and some restored barracks are also on the historic site. The Battle of Honey Springs, an important battle in Indian Territory of the Civil War, is located along here, and um, it's got a very nice new visitor center, and uh, I don't have any photos of it, but I did want to mention that. Now the California Road went along the, uh, it's a blue line, if you could see it, there we go. It's the blue line along the Canadian River, starting in Fort Smith. And this was a southern route for the gold seekers 
During the peak year of 1849, as many as 20,000 immigrants traveled on this route. They left from Fort Smith in Van Buren, Arkansas, crossing Indian Territory <clears throat> along this route that actually was first mapped out by Josiah Gregg uh, on a return trip. Um, Gregg was, of course, the the fellow who mapped out the Santa Fe Trail and wrote about that in Commerce of the Prairies. The federal government agreed to protect a party of immigrants that were traveling to California from Fort Smith in 1849 and sent Captain Randolph Marcy out there to escort a large company of them and uh, establish that Southern California road. It was a, a good road along the divide between the Washita and the Canadian rivers. And then when he returned from Santa Fe, he did find it actually to be a shorter route and a very good route going straight across like here on the 35th parallel. But then he, when he left Santa Fe, he went down south to Doña Ana and then used a different route on his way back that actually was, um, that, that came up here from Texas and was virtually the, se virtually the same as the route that the Butterfield Overland Mail used uh, a few years later. This is one of the markers in Oklahoma for that California road. And I wanted to add that uh, that same road was uh, seriously considered for the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. It was the A.W. Whipple expedition in 1853 that, that mapped out that uh, that particular route and then in 1859 uh, Captain Beale was uh, charged with establishing a national wagon road along that route and he built six iron bridges in eastern Oklahoma that were destroyed during the Civil War but uh, the 35th parallel route, route was a very important route. Now one thing we do have in Oklahoma we do have some wagon tracks and uh, these are this, this is a very nice set of them in western Oklahoma that have been um, located by our friend Art Peters, who runs the Hinton Historical Museum and has mapped out this the California road from central Oklahoma to um, all the way to the Texas line. And Bill and I traveled with him, and I, I did an article about about that route. Uh, one of the famous landmarks along the California Road in western Oklahoma is a, a mound called Rock Mary. There are all these natural mounds out there, and Rock Mary was named for a young lady named Mary Conway, who was very popular on this 1849 expedition, and uh, one of the, all the young men were trying to impress her, and one of them rode, rode his horse up to the mound and then climbed up to the top of this mound and shouted out that he was naming it for Mary. He did not end up winning her heart. Uh, another, another young officer did, um, who was tragically killed actually on the return, the turn, return trip. But anyway, this is Mulhausen's sketch of Rock Mary. And uh, he, he did this sketch in 1853 with the Whipple expedition. And this is uh, the actual, an actual photograph of Rock Mary. That is Art Peters uh, in the foreground. And another, um, another mound is Chimney Mound. You can see behind that irrigator that unfortunately I couldn't find Mulhausen's sketch of it. Uh, for this presentation, but it's 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 pretty fun to compare those old sketches with uh, what these what these formations look like today. And then, it, uh, as far as the Oklahoma section of this road, it went as far out as the 100th meridian, which were was marked then by the Antelope Hills. It still is, I guess. Uh, so this is that's our Tacoma. You might not be able to see it. It's but yeah, that's our Tacoma out there um, in the Antelope Hills. And uh, that was once the, of course, the international boundary between the United States and Mexico. So we have the Texas Road um, and the California Road. And one more route uh, through Indian Territory was the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road, which first began, became prominent when it was traveled by the Chickasaws in their migration from 1837 to 1839. And 
It was named, Boggy Depot was named for a place on the clear Boggy River uh, in the territory where the Chickasaws were being relocated uh, that was a commissary, a place to put the, some of the commissary supplies for the Chickasaws. So it was a depot on the Boggy. And uh, over the years, <clears throat> this portion of the trail uh, was, it was just commonly called the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road. Then later on with the establishment of Fort Washita in 1842, it was sometimes called the Fort Smith Fort Washita Road. But it was, it was this road that served as the primary pathway for Marcy's Doña Anna Road when he was returning from Santa Fe. And it was this road that was the, the biggest chunk that was used by the Butterfield Overland Mail Company in Indian Territory. Finally, I'm getting to the Butterfield Trail. <laughs> um, there was, as I mentioned earlier, about 200 miles of the Butterfield Overland Mail route that went through the Indian Territory. There were 12 official Butterfield stations. They were about 16 miles apart, and most of them were at the homes of Choctaw citizens who also charged tolls for the use of bridges or turnpikes along the road. Of the 12, there are three of the station keepers whose names have not been identified as either Choctaws or Chickasaws, and I've read some speculation that they may have been Butterfield employees because there's no record of them once the Butterfield uh, was no more. I, I would be interested in any, any help on that issue. An example is the case of Waddell's station I've wondered if the name was misspelled because after the Civil War, a station was operated in the same location by a man named Wells, who was a conductor for the Overland Mail. Was his name maybe misspelled as what else? We don't know. Um, but uh, we're gonna take a little virtual trip from east to west along the road and uh, find out what we can still see, which fortunately is, is quite a bit. As I mentioned, the the uh, railroad, the Katy Railroad, which came through in 1872, uh, it made the Texas Road the more important thoroughfare. And the communities that had been established along the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road or the Butter Butterfield Overland Mill, they dwindled away because of the, all the population shifted t toward the railroad. But the beauty of that is that uh, there are still all these remnants of uh, the old stagecoach road in eastern Oklahoma in, in people's pastures and uh, many, many other uh, uh, items of evidence of the old road. So that, that's kind of a neat thing and uh, uh, it makes me glad the railroad went elsewhere. So we'll begin in Fort Smith, and I'm not going to say much about Fort Smith because Bob Crossman is going to be talking about Arkansas and, and uh, uh, He's, he can probably do a better job of that than I can, but the, uh, the trail entered the Indian Territory from Fort Smith, which was established in 1817 on Bell Point, which is at the confluence of the Arkansas and the Poteau Rivers. And the stagecoach crossed on a ferry that would have been right down here. There's the Arkansas over here, and the, the Poteau comes in right through here. So the ferry would have been right over here where the stagecoach crossed. This, now this is the McClellan Kerr Navigation, Arkansas River Navigation System. It's now maintained by locks and dams at a depth, a minimum depth of nine feet so that cargo carrying bar barges can uh, navigate all the way up to Tulsa from the Gulf of Mexico. But uh, uh, before that, there were frequently sandbars out here, and obviously there was a, a lot more change in those rivers. The easternmost station in Indian Territory, the easternmost Butterfield station, is Walker's Station, and this is the historical marker that was placed in the middle of the trace of the old stagecoach road at Walker's in 1959, after a committee of the Oklahoma Historical Society toured the route for the Butterfield Centennial to identify all the stations and designate spots for, for markers. All the markers are still in place to some extent. This site was originally the Choctaw Agency. It was, the eight, it was built in 1832, it was a double log cabin, <clears throat> and 
This photo was taken in the 1920s after the cabin had been clapboarded. This structure burned down in 1947, and at that time it was the oldest structure in Oklahoma. Uh, today we can still see, let's see, so we can still see the depression of the stagecoach road at Walker's, right, right in here. And this spring that's here is called Agency Spring. It has been flowing since 1832. Of course, it flowed before then, but nobody wrote about it. <laughs> but it was one of the reasons that they built the agency there. And the neat thing is that you can still drink out of the spring that all these people uh, have drank from for all this time. They still pipe this spring water to the road for public use. And I don't know what the Department of Health in that county says about that, but I think it's pretty neat. The Choctaw Agency's presence in this location gave rise to a thriving community of Choctaws named Scullyville. Iskuli means money in Choctaw. So Iskuliville was where they got their annuity payments. And the Scullyville Cemetery is a very, very historic cemetery that holds the grave of, of many notable Choctaws. Among them is Tandy Walker, who was the station keeper at Walker Station and was also governor of the Choctaw Nation at the time the first Butterfield stagecoach came through, the stage wagon came through, I should say, that Waterman Ormsby was riding on. And you, you know, Ormsby mentioned that Walker looked like a white man, and I mentioned sometimes that uh, the Choctaws really had more white blood than they had um, native blood, and you can see that in, in uh, Tandy Walker's photograph. The next station is Trairns, and uh, these little girls are the daughters of the property owners. We took this photo uh, in 2016 or 2017, the first time that Bill and I went out there and, and drove the road. And you can see on the right that unfortunately the county road equipment unearthed the marker, <laughs> but hopefully that has been fixed. And uh, I'm gonna be going back out there soon to, to take a look at that. But Trey Earns was also the site of the council house of the Moshulatubi district of the Choctaw Nation. The, the nation was divided into three political districts, each with its own, dis, its own chief. And each district chief was to have a house built for him under the 1830 Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. Moshula Tubby was an important leader from the old days before removal and was chief over the northern district and his council house was built here at Trayerns. It stood by a spring which became known as Council House Spring and this photo shows Bill here at the Council House Spring. You can see the cut stone surrounding the spring. We made several visits out there and I was looking for the remnants of the Council House itself. It, was, it just was not apparent to me where the Council House had been. And then one day I went out there with a friend from the Choctaw Nation Historic Preservation Office and um, the, uh, there had been a large tree that was next to the spring and it had, uh, it had fallen over and uprooted and in its root ball I saw brick. And, uh, and cut stone in the root ball of that tree and looked over and I just I looked again at these cut stones and Joe Wolf, the, the fellow from the Choctaw Nation, he said, well, that's where the council house was. <laughs> and it's one of those funny things that you can look at something over and over and just not see it for what it is. And then one day it's all it's it becomes obvious. So we, we located that 1834 council house and that was a, a really fun moment. This is the Edwards store, and it's the only standing structure along the Indian Territory segment that was contemporaneous with the Overland Mail route. Um, it's a few miles beyond Trayerns and uh, was built in 1850. It may have provided meal service to travelers during the period of the Overland Mail, but we've not been able to verify that. But uh, it's, it's pretty neat. It's a dog trot. Uh, and, and by the way, the dog trot terminology comes from the breezeway that is, goes between the two log structures because that's where the dogs would seek the cool shade. 
but there's a, a, an effort underway to preserve the uh, cabin. You can see here are some of its, you can see its chimneys. There's, there are two chimneys and they're in surprisingly good condition as well as some of the hewn logs in the original structure. And this, this cabin was actually occupied until around 1980. Moving on west, there's a station called Holloway's at a gap in the mountains called the Narrows. And uh, William Holloway is one of the station keepers that we have no record of after the start of the Civil War. Another one is, uh, you know, there are a lot of cemeteries. Everybody knows that's how we find a lot of these, these places. The Riddle Cemetery near uh, uh, Wilberton, Oklahoma. Riddle was a Choctaw. And then <clears throat> on top of a mountain between Riddle's and the next Butterfield Station, and a mountain in Oklahoma is about 1,000 feet high. So, you know, it's a mountain. Uh, <laughs> but there was a small relay station, and it's called Mountain Station. And the first time Bill and I went by there, this sign was present advertising the spring being there, Mountain Station Spring. Now it's been replaced with a no trespassing sign, so I'm, I'm guessing the ownership has changed of that property, or at least their, their attitude has changed about it. But this spring served this, uh, this station, and there's the spring. In the 1930s, it was described as being surrounded by a rock structure, but obviously it's been replaced with one made of concrete. Now there's a fascinating story related to Mountain Station and photographer Edward Moybridge, who was involved in a stagecoach accident there in 1860. Moybridge is considered the grandfather of motion pictures in that he was the first to use stop motion photography when he was trying to capture Leland Stanford's horses in midair. And I don't want to give away the whole story because it's going to be in the next issue of Desert Tracks magazine. So I want to leave a little bit of mystery, but I think it's something that you will enjoy reading. The same accident that Moybridge was involved in was the only one that we know of during the operation of the Butterfield Overland Mail in which a passenger was killed and that passenger was Andrew Mackey, and he's buried here at Mountain Station. That's his grave. Out of the woods, uh, out in the woods in, in many places, we're finding traces of the old trail. This is one leaving Mountain Station and heading toward the next station, Pusley's. You can see the rock stacked along the side of the trail here. Let's see, right there. <clears throat> At Pusley's, there's still this old well in the family grave plot. We find uh, a lot of wells. The line of the old road is still like, very easy to see across this tract of land. And then from Pusley's to the next station, you have to pass over private ranch land, which most of these roads are county roads and they're easily accessible. But this is sequestered behind a locked gate most of the time. But the first time Bill and I did this drive, the gate was open and we just drove through. The path of the ranch road is apparently right on the old mail road and there's nothing out there but cows and deer. And uh, we were able to drive almost all the way through but found a locked gate at the end and had to turn around. Um, since then, I've been trying to get back on the property to investigate a couple of other sites there, but the property owners are, are not willing for me to do that right now. And I have to say they are the exception to the rule, and virtually everyone else that I have uh, contacted about coming out to look at their property has been extremely welcoming. Speaking of which, uh, the property owners near the next station, Blackburn Station, went to the trouble of cleaning up all the brambles around this marker when we went out to see it a few weeks ago. On the left is what it looked like a few years before where it was grown up with brambles. The bronze plaque has been removed, stolen. And um, on the right, there's me with a cleaned up marker and, and a big scratch on my nose because I had run into a thorn tree out in the woods, but that was okay. Uh, the next station is Waddell's, and um, this is the one I mentioned earlier for which we don't know anything about the station keeper. The marker's been moved away from the roadside. It's right there. 
It was originally placed by the roadside, but it's way back by the barn now. I have an appointment to meet this property owner uh, down there later in February. The next station is Geary's, which has now been inundated by the Atoka Reservoir, so we can't actually go there because it's underwater. Uh, it was at the crossing of North Boggy Creek. But we can still find some pretty impressive road traces on the west side of the lake. It's been closed off because this, uh, the uh, city of Oklahoma City owns this re reservoir. They built the reservoir as a water source for, the, for Oklahoma City, closed it, closed it off from vehicular access in 1955. And the road had actually been abandoned by the time the Conklings were there in 1930. So uh, a few weeks ago, I went out there and hiked in and found these, uh, these stretches of the road. And um, they're right where they ought to be on the map. You can see the rock stacked along here. And uh, got to walk about a mile of the road there. I'm going back out there in February with some folks from the Choctaw Nation's Historic Preservation Office because they're keenly interested in the site. And I'm, I'm hopeful that they're going to get interested in all of this and how they can work with um, other agencies as the National Historic Trail designation gets executed. Also on the west side of Lake Atoka, um, is an old growth short leaf pine and post oak forest that's part of the ancient cross timbers. And this old post oak is a pretty impressive specimen. Uh, post oaks don't get huge, but one way you can tell their age is by the twisted bark, and this particular one is quite large compared to the average. Then south of Lake Atoka, uh, near the crossing of the Middle Boggy River, there's a stretch of the trail that's been nicely memorialized near a museum and also a Confederate cemetery near there. Beyond Atoka is Boggy Depot, which I mentioned earlier. It was the largest settlement along the Overland Mail Route in Indian Territory. There are no structures standing anymore, but this house was the home of the Reverend Alan Wright, who's famous for suggesting the word Oklahoma as the name for the territory. Oklahoma means red people. It's a Choctaw word. Oklahoma means people, and Huma means red. And what's left here now is a historic cemetery and some interpretive signage. It's also a recreation area where you can camp, and we, we enjoyed a really nice night of camping there. The next station is Nails Crossing on the Blue River. This is an image of the rather extravagant nail home and station as it looked in the 1920s. It started out as a story and a half dog trot log cabin. And that's what it looks like now. The marker is right there. And on either side of that marker are piles of, of chimney stones. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see, yeah. So those are some of, the, some of the bricks from the chimneys. They were made by Charles Sparrow, an English brick mason who lived in Boggy Depot and also built the chimneys on Alan Wright's home. There's also a well and uh, a cellar. Steps are, here's the cellar. Steps are down there, all filled in. There's the well. Like these logs are really gonna keep people from going down there. Um, and here's a segment of the old road north of Nails. Lots of little segments out there like that. The stagecoach crossing was about here on the Blue River. And then on the other side of the Blue River is the site of Fort McCullough, which was a Confederate encampment. The only thing that's left here are earthworks. And this is, there's Bill up there with the owner of the property. And the property owner has done a lot of metal detecting. And these are some of the items that he found. I don't know, does anybody know what that was? Yeah. I'll have to tell you later. It's, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it was condoms. Yes. <laughs> Re reusable condoms? Okay. 
<clears throat> in any case, uh, from the Blue River, the road branched off. It went west to Fort Washita, and this is a stretch of the Fort Washita road with the rocks that stood up on their end right here along the trail. And then uh, another branch of it continued on south to the Red River. <clears throat> um, the Fort Washita historic site, which isn't very far away, is worth a visit. It's just a beautiful old, old site. And this is a, an old barracks that's on there. <clears throat> the next to the last station is Fishers. And it's the third one that we don't know much about as far as the station keeper is concerned. It was a stage station called Carriage Point after the Butterfield. So it's logical to think maybe that um, the Fisher name was only associated with the Butterfield, unlike many of the other stations. There's one grave here, and a couple of wells. And then we get to Colbert's Ferry. Let's see, here we go. This is the last station on the Butterfield Overland Mail Stagecoach Route in Indian Territory. It's in the Ch Chickasaw Nation. Benjamin Franklin Colbert was an enterprising Chickasaw young man who began operating the ferry across the Red River in 1853. He became quite wealthy and eventually built this impressive home called Riverside. It was his slaves who ferried Waterman Ormsby across the Red River on that first stagecoach ride. There was an impressive, there's an impressive gravestone for Colbert and uh, a marker there. This was uh, a place that Bill and I recently visited and uh, it, was, it was quite exciting to get to, to go there. The property owners were very excited to, to share it with us. And the photo on the left uh, is one that I took and the one on the right is an 1872 photo of the actual Colbert's Ferry, and thanks to Gerald Honert who brought that photo to my attention. Um, but you can see that we were just a little bit farther back uh, from the um, site than the photographer, photographer who took the older photo. Um, the bridge pilings in the background are those of uh, Colbert's 1915 toll, toll bridge. It was a part of a controversy between Texas and Oklahoma that became known as the Red River Bridge War in 1931. What happened was that a free bridge had been built across the Red River, but the toll bridge owners obtained an injunction against its opening because they were supposed to have gotten paid for their bridges, which weren't going to be any good anymore, because why would you pay the toll when you could go across the, bridge, the river for free? Um, <clears throat> but they had not been paid for their bridges. So the Texas governor complied with the injunction and blocked off the free bridge. But the Oklahoma governor, who was the very flamboyant Alfalfa Bill Murray, disagreed, and he wanted it open. The, and uh, it, although it never became a shooting war between Texas and Oklahoma, it, it got very intense. Murray called up the National Guard and even declared martial law for a brief time before it all got settled. Um, the Free Bridge did get opened a few days later and, it, and uh, the drama was over, but it has ever since then been called uh, the Red River Bridge War. And now the football rivalry between Texas and Oklahoma lives on as the, the Red River War. <laughs> Here's a closer look at the pilings of that toll bridge, which was destroyed by a gas pipeline explosion around 1960 and later demolished. But there's a tremendous amount of its wreckage lying in the river and on the banks. So it's really quite fascinating. So here we are now looking across the Red River to Texas at the end of our trip. And I'd love to hear your questions. Any thoughts, contributions to the gaps in my, my understanding? Um, and I thank you for your time. <laughs>